Hello and welcome to the Carlton Blue podcast. It's nice to see you from my one eye. Uh, it's, it's still bad. Hopefully, it's not too bad on the video. But excuse me, I'll go to the doctors later. It's very, you are. It's, yeah, it's very sore okay. now. It was mm. itchy when we did the preview, and I was like, "Oh, what about my eye?" And you couldn't really tell then. But now I've kind of been messing with it. It's sore and red and bloodshot. Yeah. Not nice. What is nice though <laughs> is the Nord VPN <laughs> discount code. Oh, what is this? If you want to get your hands on the Nord uh, VPN plan, all the information is in the description down below. Aston Villa beat Wolves at the weekend, which we're not here to talk solely about that because this is our Q and A. But a nice comeback win. The it comeback was, kings. Yeah. yeah, well, we are at the moment. I don't think any team in the Premier League is gain more points from losing positions than us after five games decent yeah so really good win um, I said before the match and after the match as well but not kind of like in hindsight but Wolves they were always going to be a difficult opponent even though they've had a poor start to the season and I've said a lot about kind of the context behind that about they've played good teams they've lost some key players but it doesn't make them a poor team and under Gary O'Neill they will set up well um, although he gets a lot of stick and I can, I can understand why he is a good coach and yeah they stifled us in the first half definitely I mean, Villa as Emery said it's the worst they've played in the first half yeah, of any bad. game and I think I probably agree um, walking down the steps at half time I was thinking like that was really drab like Villa hadn't had a shot on target but you just felt like well they can only improve from here yeah. but then winning the game I, th- I thought oh, I'm not too sure because Wolves were looking quite threatening as well we looked pretty vulnerable but that completely flipped to be fair um, on the hour mark I think that was the key point where Duran came on Villa were able to win the ball back higher, and higher up the pitch and Barkley was fantastic again just like in the Everton match and yeah Wolves had no kind of attacking um, threat so in the end Villa could uh, get the job done but you know, it doesn't feel very sustainable what they're doing. Villa kind of coming from behind all the time, but at the same time, I'm not particularly worried because this is still a, not a completely new team. We've only signed a few players who are actually in the first eleven um, or in the squad even. But it still feels like it's the start of the season. We're trying a few different things. Um, it's early, and we're what a point off the top of the table off the five games. Yeah. Obviously, got Ipswich coming up next, so. Yeah, happy days. Yeah, I tweeted about the Premier League table last night after Arsenal drew with Man City. So, like, in an alternate reality, there's a very real possibility we're on 15 points because we've beaten Arsenal because we've played well on the day. Yeah. And there's a couple of comments like, I'll blame Oli Watkins for that. And I kind of <laughs> bit back a little bit and said, well, if it weren't for Oli Watkins, we wouldn't have got back against Everton yeah, and, yeah. and Wolves, arguably. Yeah. And there's an alternative reality when we're on five points or six points. Or, whatever it, yeah, it would or, be, if, or if we sold John Duran or yeah, exactly, something happened. Yeah. Yeah. Things yeah. change very quickly, don't they, in football. Yeah. Um, but Villa have started really well they've, they've won the games that you'd probably expect them to besides West Ham where I think most would have probably predicted a draw so Villa are ahead of where I thought they'd be at this yeah. stage of the season even the Wolves game is one that we're better than them yeah. but it's still Wolves you know it's still you know, one still of those job, you? yeah exactly so um, yeah Villa are doing, doing very well I think we all know that over the course of the season if we're playing like we are we'll definitely be in the half of the Champions League again are we title contenders? Uh, not at the moment no because City and Arsenal, are, they are a level above. Um, but as we said last season, you, you are into it, you're out of it technically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, who knows? Okay, let's do some questions then. We'll start with Paul, who says, controversial question, some controversy to start the podcast. Okay. Given how much we worship him, do we give Emmy Martinez too much of a pass on some of his performances against Arsenal and Everton? Diego Carlos played a poor, pa- a poor pass against Wolves, but the ball to him from Emmy did him few favours. I think that's really hard. I think that's scratching a bit. I, I get the question, by the way, because there are a few things that Martinez is... Um, or a, f- could, a few mistakes. I think you can say that about a lot of players that are generally the likeable. You know, Ollie Watkins yeah. is very, very yeah, good. Yeah. He misses some chances. Oh, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter. Whereas yeah. if that's somebody else, you go, hang on a minute. Yeah, I understand the, the question and the point of the question, but I think to <laughs> point the finger at Martinez for Carlos' yeah. pass, I, th- I think is... Uh, <laughs> Harsh. Is this from Diego Carlos, this question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, some, he may, he's obviously made a few mistakes in his time at Villa, but it's nothing. Eccentric that, goalkeepers do, though, don't they? And then, yeah, but, and I think all goalkeepers will. I mean, we say he's the best in the world, and we believe that because there isn't a goalkeeper that I'd rather have yeah. than Martinez in the Villa team because we know what he gives us, and he's so crucial in the dressing room as well, by the way. And he's going to make a few errors. If he doesn't make any errors, then, I mean... <laughs> You know, I, it's difficult to say because we think he's the best in the world anyway. But um, yeah, like in the Everton match, was it the Everton match? There was a 
an issue with Arsenal match I can't potentially because the, the Everton match he kind of took a step to his right and then was beaten by mm. McNeil even though the shot was pinpoint you yeah. thought maybe he could do better there but I think we're kind of picking out if this was any other keeper you wouldn't even look at it yeah. because it's Martinez you're thinking Oof, if he did that he would have saved it but that's because we know he's that good he would have saved it I, I think the other way is also true I've sense. seen a lot of stuff about uh, David Roy this this week with his double save against yeah. whoever it was and uh, against Atlanta. yeah in the Champions League wasn't it and I'm not not comparing oh, David Rail's not good I'm not saying that mm-hmm. but you're, I see a lot of other saves from top goalkeepers yeah. and you think that's like fodder for Malta I, I, I literally had to say like in the Man City game where he'd come and he, he, he caught the ball from a corner and the Arsenal fans were piling onto him like <laughs> like they'd won the game like they'd won the Premier League you know, because he caught a ball and I was thinking like <laughs> Martin, <laughs> that's that all the time yeah, yeah it's weird that's, isn't it that's not something I mean yeah you celebrate it when your keeper comes and gets a, a cross of course but it felt like oh my god Rhett caught something and it's like well, yeah th- come on I've, so I, so should be. I've always said Ray's, yeah I've always said Ray's a good keeper at Brentford he was very good as well um, but Martinez makes those things look like oh yeah Martinez is doing what he yeah, does like yeah. it's nothing to celebrate so when he can see something that maybe you think he could have done better on that's because his standard is so high mm. you know it's like with Watkins when he missed those two chances against Arsenal and then uh, missed a bit of a chance against Leicester as well we were judging him against you know and yes he probably should have scored you know one of those but we know at the end of the season he'll be close to 20 goals again mm. so yeah there's no um no worries and I, I think I don't think he gets to buy Martinez by the way I think it's just because he's that good mm. There's another question here from Rob about uh, Martinez. Um, with Super John McGinn out, do we need another captain? Nothing against Emmy, but I don't think you can captain from being in goal. It's a vital role to be able to yeah. speak to the ref and have an influence. All the top clubs have a strong presence. Could it be a job for Esri Conter? What I was going to say straight away was I think you always need captains across the pitch, and that's obvious, but he makes a g- really good point about the influence yeah. um, on the pitch. And They're very strict, aren't they, now, on, on talking to the referees? Like, it has to be yeah, the captain. Yeah, and... It, would that be concert? I don't think so. If I'm being totally honest, I'm I'm not too sure who it would be. I, I um, like a midfielder as a captain. Yeah, I was going to say maybe it's a Telemans or a job for Anana, maybe even though he's still young and he just joined the club. But yeah, I don't actually think we can replace that on the pitch mm. necessarily. I think McGinn brings uh, an awful lot in that regard. So I'm not going to pretend that anyone else could do it. Essentially, I think it's one of those things that you have or you don't, and some players will take time to have that yeah. like, like McGinn has because when he first had the armband I think we were all thinking well Mings is still going to be the leader on the pitch mm. but obviously Mings hasn't been playing and I do think McGinn has stepped up in that regard yeah. maybe it's Tielemans but I don't think anyone would be doing that like McGinn at the moment we don't obviously have a we don't know how long McGinn's going to be out for Emery said it could be a few weeks it could be less than that because we don't know so he'll be doing everything he can to try and be fit for the buying game but it looks like it's a race against time too now soon. And even if he was ready, is he ready? Ready <laughs> for a game at Villa? You know, that's a massive game for Villa. They're going to play yeah. a player who is, yes, the captain, but also not 100%, because I can't see him being 100% for that game, even no. if he was in the squad. Yeah. So it's desperately um, disappointing for him. But yeah, that is football, unfortunately. Okay, next question. Jay says, which comeback was more impressive, the one against Everton or the one against Wolves? Brackets, ignoring the makeshift derby as a factor. I think that's a really good question. Wow. It's difficult because I think question. the Everton is obviously a two goal deficit. Whereas the Wolves mm. one, we were woeful in the first half. So we yeah. kind of had to you know, do the comeback in yeah. 30 minutes, really. I, I, I always felt like we should have enough to win both games. I felt like we were more likely to win the Everton match than the Wolves one, though. Yeah. Even yeah. though when we went two behind, I was thinking, okay, this is going to be difficult, but get a goal. And we did before half time. And all you've got to do is. You know, so win the second half. You've got to do a bit more than that. But it, that felt almost like it, we can use. Do you reckon that came a little bit because of they'd thrown away a two goal lead just the week before? As yeah, well, and, and, and we know they're brittle. And to be fair, uh, Wolves gave away a lead against Newcastle as well, but that mm. didn't really come in my thinking. It was more that I know Wolves are very, uh, or can be very solid and stingy under O'Neill. And I think they were trying to be at points as well. Yeah. Uh, it didn't quite work. I think as soon as Watkins scored, it just felt inevitable that we were going to win the match. But um, you also had the kind of, how do I say it, like kind of uh, game state in a way that there was 14 minutes or 13 minutes added time. And although that's 40 minutes is a long time, it's still, in added time, and I do think like mentally there is a difference there between playing in the 77th minute to it being like the 90 
second, mm. if that makes sense. You, I just feel like you probably automatically rush things. And I know Villa have been good at not doing that, like when Bailey came on the pitch against Lille and said, we've still got time. But I still think even like the crowd will probably get more like anxious if we were still drawing on 95, even though we had 10, 11 minutes left. Um, obviously, by then we were 3-1 up. So I would probably say Wolves come back was more mm. impressive. Just not not an audience question, just one for me that like I saw kind of on social media before I came in, kind of <laughs> almost comparing us with Real Madrid, which, you know, bear with me a second. I know where this is going though, yeah. About like elite teams mm-hmm. find a way to, yeah. to come back and, and, and win late on. Like Leverkusen last season. Exactly, yeah. Anderson. And it comes into the style of play that we're patient, we go through the same motions mm-hmm. and we feel like, well, eventually if we keep doing what we know works, it will work. Mm-hmm. Tiring the opposition out by playing the way that we do means yeah. we can kind of go for longer. Um, We've not scored loads of late goals in terms of like 90 pluses, apart from obviously you know the Wolves goals were were late, 88 or, or something like that. Yeah. But even like the Durant goals against Leicester and possibly West Ham were like 70 or something like that, which is not like you know 90 Before plus, but minute, yeah. you know getting on towards the, the yeah. latter stage of the game. Is that something in the way we play? Do you think that we kind of just break teams down eventually? Yeah, I think firstly it's in a, in a way that we play. Um, I think although your two examples there are both away matches which is obviously good but being at home as well Emery said that while he always likes to have uh, organisation for his players to know where they need to be at the right times at some point you kind of need to just play with your heart which was Mm. nice he said that before as well I can't remember what game it was it might have been the Palace game actually from last season when we won uh, 3-1 but I liked that because uh, kind of it shows that we can use the power of Villa Park, as what I said a few times, um, to, our, to our advantage. But going away from home, yeah, I think that is probably more... We know that we're good enough to beat teams, and it just comes with experience, really. Mm. I, I think that is the crucial thing here. Because, um, as you said, Dan, all the good teams have it in them. Good teams obviously finish higher up in the table, so there's obviously something in having an experience of winning matches and trusting not necessarily trusting the process but trusting and having belief in what you're doing on the pitch but also as fans as well we're kind of sitting there going well if we score we'll win like you see with Man United throughout the years so there's, if, less, if there's that, less stress and there's less anxiety yeah, maybe. And you know, I don't know whether that comes across onto the pitch or not but there's that whether the players think it as well mm. we know that we're good enough that if we score a goal we'll probably get another yeah. and that might be enough to yeah. change, change the game around yeah. and you see Man United over the years always finding a way to win always yeah. finding a way to score a late goal mm. going back to the Ferguson era or even now when yeah. they're not very good they're still oh Christ they've won again and if you flip it the opposition as well they know what's well, coming yeah, yeah, yeah. and they know that they have to take their chance because if they don't because how many times have we been in that position as a team who have yeah. maybe scored at Chelsea and, and then thinking, well for 60 minutes but yeah, you still lose and we need to get another one here and you think well we can't win 2-0 and all of a sudden <laughs> it's 1-0-2-1-3-1 one, one, and yeah. you'd, you'd thought oh well we played well for a little bit that's kind of what they yeah, yeah like Wolves can probably take a few positives from the game against Villa but you lost 3-1 like and we're that team now yeah. which is um, yeah which it's is good, great it? <laughs> it still feels a bit strange because I'm at the start I've said oh, I don't think it's very sustainable it is sustainable in terms of having the ability to come back but it's just that obviously you don't want to be conceding goals yeah. full stop. So I don't know if there's any questions on conceding yeah, goals. Yeah, the next and, one. Uh, okay, <laughs> we do we go uh, Avillafan.com, despite a promising start, is the lack of clean sheets a worry? Yeah. It will be at some point, yeah. won't it? Yeah. Because yeah, Man United yeah. might score two in a couple of weeks mm-hmm. and that's too much of a deficit for, yeah. for, for us to overcome. It, it is a worry. The young boys game, yes, we kept a clean sheet, but um, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot to take out of that. But in the Premier League, we are conceding goals. We're not conceding um, two goals every game, but we're conceding two goals a lot. Obviously, against Wolves, we only conceded once. But, yeah, it felt like Wolves, if they had more uh, attacking threat or if they um, try to get that second goal more than what they did, basically, I think we could have conceded twice again. Or we just look vulnerable. And to be honest, I th- by the way, I think Carlos actually played okay actually after his mistake I thought he played quite well but I am worried about <laughs> our um, about our defence at the moment and we always go on about Kamara we'll have to wait and see if that is the yeah. solution but I don't know if there's a silver bullet to this to be honest I, I think maybe in the way that we play we're okay with leaving the opposition with some chances and that we'll score two or three again doesn't doesn't kind of fill you with confidence going in, into every game that we're going to have to score three goals to win a match. It, we, we know we're capable of doing it, but when Emery first came in, we had that streak of just winning games 1-0 or 2-0 or 2-1 tight matches, but you always felt confident and 
you know, it, those performances are very mature. At the moment, it still feels a bit kind of um, wild. And I'm not going to kind of criticise that too much because there's a long way the season to go. We're only f- a few weeks into the season at the moment. But if, you know, we're getting into kind of like December territory and we've only kept like two clean sheets, which at the moment is, would be about right if mm. you're going off the average of the last year. Um, but if we're winning games... But that's what I mean. It, it depends, really. If we've got enough points and enough wins, then you'd probably say, OK, well, we're just that team that will concede goals yeah. and win matches still. But if you told me right now you're going to keep two clean sheets for the next 12 matches, it's going to be difficult to you know, pick up as many mm. wins as what we'd like to. So yeah. I am worried by it. Again, I don't have the answers for it. But um, I'm sure that's a big priority I think it certainly comes into the way we play as well knowing that because you've got Martinez in goal who's great at one-on-ones that we can play further up and if a ball does go in behind yes we're going to give a striker a Mm one-on-one maybe once a game or twice a game but we back Martinez to make that save and I also think that when we do come up against uh, better sides although we should have been out of sight against Arsenal um, we defended pretty well for the most part I just think more clinical teams they will punish us even more and yeah, coming back from two goals or conceding two goals a game, it's just, it, that can't be something that we are happy with, essentially. I know last season we conceded, I think, the most goals or second most goals, I can't quite remember, of any team to finish in the top four yeah. since the Premier League was uh, made. <laughs> I know four didn't start in 92, but that's the good, it's massive sample size. So yeah, um, while it's not something that we'll if we can see lots of goals again this season basically we could still finish in the top four however it obviously makes the chances slimmer next up from Wayne he asks is it time we started putting respect on Ross Barkley's name he changed the game yesterday and was excellent against Everton too another example of Emery's phenomenal man management now we've raved about Bark I think on the podcast in the post-match shows in the previews that he yeah. didn't single-handedly but he changed the game against Leicester yeah. and Everton and Wolves yeah. coming on on the 60 minute mark just ticking things along really nicely and him having that kind of calm composed head and that experience and quite a young side really has absolutely changed the game yeah for sure I also thought when he came on it helped Tielemans as well yeah. um, Tielemans still played very well but I felt Wolves with Andre and uh, Joel Gomez who I think are two very good players I thought they actually dealt with Tielemans pretty well up until that point in the match Um I liked them. Uh, those Wolves players and they're good. But as soon as Barkley came on, yeah, they had more control, they were more composed, which obviously allows Tielemans to be the same with more possession and in better areas of the pitch, essentially, to influence the game. So Barkley helped, didn't only just help his teammates with how he played, but I thought he helped the team and the structure, basically. Yeah. You know, this is obviously a player who has um, had one good season in his last however many years at Luton, a yeah, team who are yeah. uh, very different to Villa so how does that you know translate and yeah it'll be interesting to see how he goes over the course of the season because of Villa's because of Villa's uh, options but he's already you know while he's not starting games he's making a big impact and this is kind of similar in a way to John Duran of they probably want to be playing 90 minutes every week but at the same time they're probably not content but they'll still be happy to come off the pitch knowing that oh I've kind of just influenced this winning yeah, the yeah. match here you'd like to think so and that is the kind of the key point for Villa because they are a top four side um, Barkley would have played in uh, Chelsea when they were in going for the top four he'll know that those sides have to rotate yeah. and he won't be asking for starts every match I know he said that he wanted to get back in the England team playing for Villa and that seems um, quite, uh, quite I, don't, I don't know maybe un, unrealistic because he's not playing I think you've got to be starting games week in week out to play yeah. for your national side and yeah. at the moment I mean I love the idea of Barkley starting because he's been that good but then how can he start mm. I mean we might see a different change maybe with McGinn out but long term Barkley's not going to start 38 league games for us just no. because of the depth but that we've if got if he's coming off the bench and making a good impact then great if Tillemans gets injured for five games which might happen Barkley comes in yeah. it's his shirt to lose then like yeah. there will be chopping and changing over the season so I think that's the key thing it's just at the moment we've had a couple of injuries but we haven't had anything as bad as what we've had this time last season which feels almost strange because yeah. our squad is so good when you look at it player for player and Mings and Kamara both coming back it, it's um, it's a stacked team so that's a major 
positive, obviously. Next question, AVFC on camera, Pete Hitchman. Uh, in the last Q&A, John suggested Yuri Tielemans was signed because they knew Louise was needed to be the PSR sacrifice, mm-hmm. which we've spoken about. So, by summer, Louise was the least irreplaceable player with sale value. Yeah. Who does John think is that same player if we have to sell again next summer? Oh, Pete. He's giving you a suggestion, but I'll wait uh, first. Okay. Um... <laughs> I hate answering these questions because a male writer wants to sell Ollie Watkins. <laughs> is that the answer then? Uh, he said, uh, "Could it be Ollie Watkins if wh- Duran keeps that, it up?" F- okay, I'm going to answer this as well as I can. Firstly, Villa don't know if they're going to be in that position. Secondly, they never want to sell key players, as mm. we saw two summers ago when they sold academy players instead of yeah. a key man. Um, and they've obviously sold Diaby. They've sold. Louise. Louise so that's a decent chunk that they made this summer and obviously they were close in June but I, I don't know what position they are in financially coming into next season Damian says that that could be or will be due to how they're doing the Champions League mm. millions of pounds up for stake there Yeah. Um, however if massive if if Villa have to make X amount of money um, and it's a key player that has to go you have to look at where is the um, ready-made replacement essentially Morgan Rogers has come in and done extremely well I don't think he's necessarily a replacement for Ramsey because they play together yeah. uh, or have and can do that so you're kind of looking at well, where, where can Villa make money Ramsey is a homegrown talent they don't want to sell him and they didn't want to sell him Emery said no they could have and solved all their PSR issues but they didn't cause they wanted to work with him so is that something that Villa would then do in the summer and sell him I, so that's unlikely because yeah. why would Emery say no and then um, that would be that he's not had a very good season in which case he wouldn't be sellable anyway yeah and I can't see that happening Ezra Conch is obviously a fantastic talent as well but if we were to sell him do we have a replacement for him we absolutely don't no nope. where else are you looking in the team um, Leon Bailey do we have a replacement right now I don't think so you've obviously got Jaden Philogene who they rate extremely highly very different player set at Bailey in some ways I think Leon Bailey's an outstanding player and I don't think we have anything like him in the team Ollie Watkins we obviously have John Duran who I think is one of if not the most exciting young striker in world football so the easy answer and this is horrible would be to say if we had to raise I don't know 70 million or something which sounds like a lot mm. firstly we simply wouldn't want to do that through one player but if it had to be through one player and there was a big offer for a 30 year old striker then Villa may consider it and they would obviously consider it knowing that they have Duran yeah. there as well so yes again if is the key word here but if that was the case then that would be the most obvious thing however Watkins is still I think going to get near to 20 if not break that record this season he'll break the Villa um, all time scoring record from Gabby I think and that's going to be a difficult decision even though we have Duran because that's your player who's bagging 20 you still have to replace those goals yeah. somehow that would bring be bringing in a new striker presumably so there really isn't an, an easy answer there and at the moment I think it's probably too early to look at it for example when Louise we knew um, kind of as the season went on that that was a situation that could develop because of the contract situation and because um, because of how Villa's finances were but at this point it's too early to say so yeah. I'm not absolutely not suggesting that it's something that would happen but if you have to look at it at the Villa's key players and analyse them I think that's kind of what we've done there well answered I think Jack says do we have to offer Duran a bumper new contract and start him a bit more in order to fend off the inevitable interest in January personally I think he is worth whatever it takes lad is class in many aspects and I think he could be useful on set pieces too I'd like to think that he would commit his future because Villa would be saying to him you know look at how far you've come here's the plan it's working you know well, yeah. and you look settled now the fans love you again <laughs> or, <laughs> for now <laughs> for now <laughs> yeah um, so everything adds up there and they would still say to him look if a massive offer arrives from a team and it suits us then you know you could still get that move if you wanted it because we can't beat around the bush here Durand wanted to leave to Chelsea he yeah. wanted to go to West Ham and while some people will be saying yeah but he wasn't supported right or he didn't have the right um, kind of guidance with it I still think if a big offer came in from another club and Chelsea said you'll be our main striker Durand would rather be in that position and I'm not trying to be negative here I think that's just the facts we, we can't just because he scored goals 
kind of forget that he kind of made his bed essentially mm. um, however it must be kind of balanced with the fact that he's now respecting his teammates more people around board him more like he's much more mature got a long way to go still but Villa will ha- obviously have interest from a lot of clubs everyone wants <laughs> John Duran but his price I'd like to think that we could get whatever we want for him again we don't want to sell him and I would hate to let John Duran go by the way because he is such an exciting prospect exciting not just because he's a good player but also the way he does it I feel like that's just something that you want in your team not mm. not the uh, not the negative parts but the I don't know like the dark arts the, the way he does it like it just I just think that is something that can work for you as well um, would you rather sell him or Watkins Die, oh, you idiot <laughs> oh. <laughs> don't ask me that oh. that's a horrible it's my, question it's my job that is a really difficult question though because <laughs> I'm not answering that question <laughs> okay um Burger Mail journalists refuse to answer a question <laughs> over Ollie Watkins' future. Um, hopefully, there is a new contract soon. He obviously deserves one um, for his performances, and Villa can, yeah, when there's interest, they can say, pay £100 million, whatever it may be, because he's that good. Mm. Look, why would we accept anything uh, less than the going great for the most exciting striker in Europe? Yeah. Julie asks, early thoughts on Lamar Bogard, please. Is he going to learn quick enough? Are we counting the days till cash returns? Or do we have to accept that concert is our only solid option in that area? I think a problem Villa have got here is that arguably, I mean, I was going to say, arguably as we country is Villa's best centre-back. Yeah. But Pau Torres has got a great claim for that. I think Contra is better hmm. as a centre-back. But Contra is probably our best right-back <laughs> as well at the moment, and that's a problem. Yeah, the, the, I actually thought it was really interesting to hear Emery. I don't know if anyone read. Well, hopefully they did. <laughs> if people aren't aware, um, and there'll be some quotes on Birmingham Live if you can find the article. It'll be on my off the page somewhere. He spoke in his press conference in the embargoed section on Friday about about this kind of dynamic between him, Carlos, um, Bogard. Like because obviously in the summer it was a big thing that Villa wanted obviously Gertrude Carlos was going to leave chose not to in the end and Villa were happy with it you know they were never going to force him out but then Emery did say at the start of the season in the first three games he suggested that Villa weren't going to be playing contra right back anymore and that he's yeah. a centre back He's that's going to be his position and we'll build up in a different way and they were building up in a different way like we saw it in the first couple of games but that seems to have change now Emery seems to kind of gone back on that a little bit and whether that's because Bagard he doesn't think is quite ready mm. or he's also something not a right back. yeah well, he only played right back once for the academy or something like it's something crazy but he did play right back when Villa played Cardiff in a um, okay. lock what was that was that lock no winter break was that I think oh like a friendly thing yeah I don't know yeah. if you remember we went to Cardiff I think we lost did we lose I can't remember oh yeah it rings a bell yeah around the time we played Villarreal that kind of yeah. weird yeah. things the World, the World Cup, Cup. Break. yeah I think so um, and Bogard played right back there and Emery liked it so that's why that happened but it's a strange dynamic now because he's Emery and maybe I'm wrong but the way I heard him at the start of the season until now it seems to have changed his mind about it yeah a we'll have bit. a full back who's going to go up and down whereas that's not what we're seeing at the moment yeah and when Cash comes back maybe we'll just play a back four again or mm. back three with Cash but <laughs> Emery also said, well, we can also play four centre-backs. And I thought, wow, like, <laughs> what are we going to do? <laughs> because obviously when Mings comes back, you know, that could be an option as we've seen Arsenal and City play their, play their four centre-backs as well. Maybe it would be a Mings left-back situation or Torres. Um, Conza, Carlos, you'd have four of them in certain games. What, How that would leave Matson? don't know and the rest of the dynamic of the team as well but it's all very interesting. I, I'm sure Emery knows what he wants to do but at the moment we're kind of left with every possibility Adam asks and we get this probably every week and this wasn't the only person who asked it what happened to the Aston Villa documentary that we heard about last season like I said I've been getting this all the time I'm not ignoring it because we don't want to talk about it it's just that we don't have a good enough coherent answer to say oh yes it's this this and this it's just all gone very quiet and that's that yeah I have nothing to um <laughs> say on it so just make for a good podcast <laughs> exactly which is why I often leave it out but uh, there's the answer we Sorry don't for know. ignoring it right? yeah uh, Matt says if Uno gets a red card or a touchline ban who takes over the touchline emotional roller coaster? would Paco be the man or would McPhee take the front of house reins for the game <laughs> it's a, it's a, re- a really weird thing because we've spoken before about like Emery being like respectful on the touchline and whatever and he's getting them for 
just dancing around his touchline uh, area and coming out of his box. He's more out of his box sometimes, to be fair. Yeah. And he's he's always done that. I can't but remember why he got booked for the Wolves one, but I was sympathising for him. There was there was an issue, but it was like he's complaining because there's yeah he needs answers. <laughs> yeah, someone give him answers. He wasn't he wasn't shouting at anyone for no reason. Like it's it, strange. It felt a bit like he can't shout but then when managers are because he always he said this before Emery he always said he never understands why assistants of the opposition team get up and talk always in the fourth official's ear yeah. and they don't, they don't get booked for it but they're constantly trying to yeah. I don't, he didn't say this but in my opinion it would be to influence you know decisions or why else would you talk to them yeah. essentially because whatever they say doesn't impact anything you know so he, he always gets annoyed by that so when he gets booked he's probably thinking like you know, I'm just trying what, to... What am I supposed to do? Yeah, yeah. like, yeah. I, just, I want an answer for what's something that I don't agree with. And I, again, although I've just said it doesn't influence anything. He, yeah, you still have the right to reply, basically. Yeah, and whereas disagree with something. It, there's people who are just in the four officials ear on stuff that isn't important. Mm. Yeah, I just think it's really strange to answer the question, what does happen? Because Emery is... Like, I don't know how much really... Yeah the manager has an influence on the sidelines. Well, I does think that... Emery might have a fair bit. Do you think? Because he, he does... Because he's, he's telling the players stuff and they're, they're looking at him, they're listening, but yeah. I don't know how much of that actually goes in and changes it, things. It won't be a lot, but it'll, it could be the difference between something. Marginal some point, the, the may, He might spot something that no one else is spotting. Mm. And his communication on the sideline is obviously good because he doesn't stop. And Although, yes, he's dancing. You can <laughs> you can tell that the players are looking over and thinking... He calls them over okay, a lot, doesn't he, do as well? Like for yeah. When they have a little drink. Yeah. He was in Morgan Rogers' ear the other day. Yeah. Well, loads of players. And that can be useful. In the, like we saw Arsenal when Ray would be on the floor. It does help, essentially, let you, letting your teammates have a team talk with your manager. Mm. We wouldn't be able to do that if Emery isn't there. So I do think that would be a loss for him. Um, a loss for us, sorry, if he wasn't there. But obviously, he now knows he's one away. So hopefully, he kind of reigns that in a little bit. Yeah. Issa says, with John Townley, spelt J-H-O-N, which I appreciated, yeah, I love it. Uh, giving up his season ticket to work as the Villa correspondent, what happens if he decides to stop being the Villa correspondent? Does he automatically get his season ticket back or would you have to join the lengthy waiting list? Yeah, I'm not... No, no, yeah, I'll join it back. There's no... Like, Especially if you're just like, oh, I'm not going to do this job anymore. By the way, can I have my ticket yeah, back? Yeah, not to be like the the saint, but like that, I couldn't run, even, nah. if, even if I was offered it, which obviously wouldn't be the case because I have no... Uh, I think like, you'd have to have like, a massive point. ego, just like, Oh yeah, I'm having it back. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'll deserve it back. Yeah, it'd be like Philip Schofield and Holly Willoughby going to <laughs> see the passing, you know, the passing of the coin when when they just yeah, jump the queue. Yeah, they cut the queue. Oh right, yeah. Because yeah. they had to go home or something. I wonder where that was going for a minute. Disgraceful. Um, <laughs> what would happen? I would uh, share it with my brother. Okay. However, I plan to be in this job <laughs> for as long as I'm alive. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Matt doesn't. <laughs> uh, right. Penultimate question in this section from John. Villa fans jest after another Unai Emery masterclass by saying, give him a lifetime contract or build the statue. But what feat would Emery have to achieve for there to be a genuine discussion over building his statue outside Villa Park? Obviously a trophy or yeah. two. But if a certain he, level of trophy, I would argue. Do you think? Yeah. I think longevity is key here. If he yeah. spent 10 years at Villa and we were constantly in Europe... Yeah. I, th- like I, I, I think because of modern football and no one likes this but because of modern football we know how difficult it is and how important it is also to raise our revenue basically play well to increase revenue which is mad but I just feel like we know that if we didn't have Unai as Damian said we would just be in a constant flux of mm, yeah. going nowhere just treading water and treading water but I think because there's other influential figures at Villa Villa, don't yeah, have a statue that's already. why I'm questioning it yeah. um, and that's probably the issue here there should be yeah well, there should be a Ron Saunders statue yeah. or a Dennis Mortimer or statue or the stand with name or the yeah. North stand nef- named after but we can kind of go into that debate but would Unai be in the conversation with those people I'd, I'd say so if he wins trophies and keeps us where we are for another 10 years. Mm. I think if he was here for five, it would be like, oh, that was a great era for Villa. But obviously... In the grand it, scheme of their history, not really yeah, very long. But if Unai is the man who cements us... Because basically legacy, I think, is really important for me. Mm. If, if we had five years with Emery, continuing now, and we did well and we were playing in Europe, but then after he left, we dropped down a bit and we were... I don't know, say like, well, where West Ham are, kind of yeah. trying to punch up there, but not really getting there. I don't think that's where we'll be, by the way. I think that we'll be able to sustain revenue and we'd be able to live after Unai, hopefully. And hopefully that's, you know, <laughs> way down the future. I don't want to think about it. But 
if it is the case that Unai is here for 10 years or something and then after him it was just a succession afterwards because we were yeah. that club now we were a mm. I hate it but big six big seven club you know we are that because of him yeah so that would be that would, too worthy I think I think so and that might be kind of hard to believe right now but if we were to do that that's a massive achievement in itself mm. uh, and again trophies we spoke about, we spoke about life after Emmy last week didn't we and we kind of we fear it it sounds, it sounds horrible and isn't worth thinking about mm. but you're right if, if life after Unai is because he's got us to a certain level that we can get yeah I don't know give me a good well, manager's name well, or, or the, well there'd probably be a different manager then but, yeah because it's like, so long away but we take the best manager yeah. that we can get at that time yeah. and we also carries on Emery's legacy yeah. that's very different to as you say it just, this just being a blip for yeah. a blip <laughs> for like seven or eight years mm-hmm. and then it's back to where we were yeah and I don't know people might be saying oh give one to Suarez then or give it to Edens as well but I just think f- <laughs> they're very wealthy people and they've done fantastic in their business world and thank you very much for saving the club <laughs> <laughs> and, and investing your money but no trophy great but my kind Statue, of point sorry. here is that they had to U- Unai is the key here yeah uh, oh, yes they did everything they've done and their hands are behind their back essentially so if there was no rules they could push push us hopefully to where we are now and whatever but how we're doing it under Unai it is, it's a miracle basically it genuinely is because yeah. we would not be here without him competing as we are. It just simply oh, wouldn't be 100%. happening. So if we can sustain that over a line of the decade and build our revenue and be that club that people always aspire to be, well, then we're set, essentially. Yeah. And who knows, in 10 years, there might be no more Premier League and it might be something different, but we would be in the conversation of being in that elite category. And again, I would hate for there to be like a Super League or something, of course. But those clubs who were named in there that's because they've been very successful and Tottenham haven't been, yes, but they're in London and their revenue has been brilliant and Daniel Levy, although he gets lots of stick, knows exactly what he's doing. Um, our version of that is you and I. Yeah. Okay, final question in the football section, but it's partly a silly one from Julie uh, who says, can I ask a silly question? I love the electronic boards all around the ground. They really stand out, which mm-hmm. to be fair, it, uh, you look at it and go, I really like, like that. Proper yeah, I really look. like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> would you be in favour of displaying emojis at the right time for a bit of sh- houseery? For example, <laughs> crying emoji if a goal gets ruled out or waving when their fans start leaving. Which I really love the idea of. Whether it was yeah. an emoji or not, I don't know. But like, <laughs> you're only coming to see the villa, like going all the way around the stadium. Yeah, when not their memes fans leave. around the yeah. stadium. Yeah. Yeah. What, I'm, what do you think? Uh, <laughs> that's something that will probably happen in the MLS first. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, why you not? don't know I'd... what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. See the villa. <laughs> Let's do comment of the week first. We'll, do, we'll end on the silly questions again. Uh, from Rich, who said, oh, this is a nice one. Oh, nice. I love Dash, but John being the Villa correspondent is great for the podcast. He's passionate, knowledgeable, and speaks very well. Plus, you can see he's living his dream job. It all goes for great content. Great show as always, lads. Being a Villa fan that's moved abroad, your coverage is very much appreciated. <laughs> and I know that's not very self-indulgent to highlight that comment, but when I went through on the last video, it was the top one. They're all negative. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rest were going, John's a... Rich, cheers, Rich. Yeah, uh, everything you said was correct about me uh, <laughs> I'm a Villa fan and this is absolutely a dream job yeah. I mean I've obviously been over that kind of stuff before but it's um, there are some days when I wake up and I think like I, I don't have a job like yeah, that I sounds really mean. cringe but like just I mean my partner probably hates it or does hate it because I'm constantly doing work and mm. I'm constantly burying my laptop and <laughs> ignoring her essentially <laughs> sometimes which, which is bad I do need to improve my uh Work-life balance. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm the same. But then I, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult to be honest because I'm just so invested. Especially in when Villa are good as well. Like it's tempting yeah, to that go, is it. Should yeah. we just do another yeah. quick podcast? Yeah. Like, should yeah. we just do something else? Because we're like so yeah. eager to do stuff. That's why when we come back from, like the Wolves match, to be fair, like I was thinking, like today's my day off, and, but yeah, I love doing the podcast. So we just go in the office and even though it's not a working day, um, but I was thinking, like, do I want to be working? Because I was working Sunday as well. Do I want to wake up tomorrow and work, writing about a villa defeat? No. Do I want to come into the office? No. When we lose and want to talk about it. But you still would. And you have to obviously take it both ways. So I do feel very lucky for us that I'm doing the job, but also that Villa are good. Because I know that obviously, yeah. like Ash, for example, had the Gerard era. Um, yeah. Just 
getting promoted and although at different times you know if we win a game then that feels like we've won four games kind of thing because it was so big and so rare um, yeah so when we lose a game now it's, it feels like we've just lost six in a row but uh, yeah I, this isn't a job I would change for the world I would be doing it I always say I would be doing it for like I probably shouldn't say this in case Matt's listening but I would be doing it for like half my wage like it's just <laughs> oh yeah don't say that it's um you should not be saying that at all you're gonna have to cut that out <laughs> Okay, right, let's end on the silly question then. As I said last week, I did a separate post to get loads of silly questions, so we've got loads to choose yeah. from. We always try and do two, but if they're quick, I'm happy to do a couple of extra. Do you want to pick a number between one and nine? Seven and two. Matt Bird says, Did you notice that, that during the game against Young Boys, it had to be stopped because the number 24 took a shot square in the plums? Do you remember that? No. No, I don't either, but we'll go with it for now. So, if you had to receive a ball cl- kicked into your gentleman region oh. by one of the current squad, Ooh. who would it be? All right, who has the worst shot? Who's got the weakest ball kicking who, ability? Miss? Um, oh, that's a good shout, yeah, you could miss. I'm trying to think who, who, who has the most finesse. Because John Duran would absolutely kill you. <laughs> Telemann strikes a good ball. I, I think I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick a nice guy. I reckon someone like Leon Bailey would be, he'd like feel sorry for you and be like, I've got, if I've got to do it, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just, you know, kick it. I would probably, uh, maybe R- Morgan Rogers, maybe. <laughs> Based like, on what? I don't know. Yeah. I feel, no, I feel like I'm trying to think. If someone's shooting on the edge of the box, how would they shoot? All right. I feel like Rogers would try and place it. Rather Durand than just would leather it. Leather it. Mm. Telemann strikes it well. Telemann, yeah. uh, Anana hit a, hit a good strike against Young Boys. Ramsey always likes to hit it. I'd probably say Rogers because I, I feel like he tries to place it. Uh, what, about Luca less, Dean? Huh? what about Luca Dean? Like Curly and then a cross. True, yeah. yeah. Luca Dean might be the good answer here. Yeah. I reckon he's also a nice guy. Or Pal Torres, maybe. He might just try and clip it. Yeah. To make sure he hits it. <laughs> clip what? <laughs> I'll go with Pal Torres. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah I can see the reason. He's probably behind trying that. to swaz it, which takes off the power. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, and the other one that you picked was uh, from Ricardo. Who would be a better player? A Barry Bannon sized Amadou Anana. Like this. Or an Amadou Anana sized Barry Bannon. A Barry Bannon version of. If you gave Barry Bannon <laughs> Amadou Anana's height. Y- yes. Yeah, or the other way around. Yeah. Or if you gave Amadou Anana Barry. So basically okay, a right. small Anana yeah, it would, or a it would, big. Right, okay. Yeah. So it has to be a tall Barry Bannon. Do you think? Yeah, because I think Anana's qualities, a lot of it is because of his frame and his size and his physicality. I'm not right. saying Barry is a better technical player than Anana. However, it's very underrated, Barry Bannon, technically. Mm, yeah. outrageous, technically. Good left And foot. especially, um, I don't know, five years ago or something, he was very, very good. So, um, Although in the championship, yeah. But I would rather, I think it would be the better of the two. I think if you gave... So what have you picked again? Clarify for me. A tall Barry Bannon. An Amadou and Anana sized Barry Bannon. So Barry Bannon's ability, which is crazy, (laughs) and Anana's size. I'd rather have that than Anana's ability that's five foot five or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Because he's a It would take away a lot from his game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to do one more? Yeah, go for it. Go on then, pick a number. One. (sighs) Adam says. Don't like that sigh. No. Would you rather drink soup? from a farmer's welly or a bin man's sock I think that's pretty obvious I answer. don't think that's that difficult welly yeah yeah 100% I think welly because that protects I mean Christ you're eating out of his foot sweat or whatever yeah but like all but the bad not, stuff of a farm like the mud and the cow poo and stuff yeah, is on the outside of yeah. well hopefully anyway yeah. whereas the inside of a bin man's sock is the pure sweat and grime and yeah no disrespect to bin men obviously but well, to be fair, they got shoes on as well. I'm not, that's not suggesting yeah, their socks are full of bins. Yeah, it's juice. not as if they're standing in bins. Yeah, but not as far I also know. feel, yeah, yeah. I don't have much more to say on it, but I think a welly would be better protected from the elements. That's the end of our weekly Q and A session. Thank you very much, John, for your time as always. Cheers. Uh, Wickham is tomorrow and we'll be doing a post-match show for that not sure who's on it yet uh, but keep an eye on the channel for that we'll have a preview to 
Ipswich uh, at the back end of the week and the post-match for Ipswich as well. We've also recorded an interview today, not with a former player or a manager, but someone who is an absolute Aston Villa hero, in my opinion. Uh, don't know when that's coming yet, but there's your little teaser. Could be this week, could be next. But John, thank you for joining me. Thank you for watching or listening to this episode of the Current Blue Podcast, and we'll see you soon.